This is Dr. Mishra. Um, I am a practicing psychiatrist for 32 years. I have a special interest in the fields of uh, mood disorder and depression. And it is this with, with this background, I come and do this presentation today uh, on a very timely topic. Um, I have prepared some slides here, which uh, I will take about 40, 45 minutes or so to complete. That will leave us about 15, 20 minutes time for Q&A or discussion session. I just want to um, say this thing that uh, I will not be able to answer any specific treatment question for a person uh, because that is a decision between the patient and the doctor. But I will be very happy to answer any general questions related to uh, depression in women at various stages and their treatment, etc. So without any further delay, I will start uh, the presentation. First of all, let's talk about how common is depression. Uh, so first of all, I want to say that depression is very common, both in men and women, uh, and it is the leading cause of disability worldwide. But de depression is especially more common in women compared to men. Actually, it is twice as common in women, women compared to men. Now, I want to describe a term called prevalence. Uh, prevalence means number of cases of a condition or disorder in a community over a time frame or at a point of time. So you will see here that lifetime, uh, in, in their lifetime, women, 21% of women will develop depression compared to 12% of men. So even 12% of men developing depression is a high number, but women, almost one quarter of women will develop depression during their lifetime. Now, in any given year, um, women will, 13% of women will develop depression compared to 8% of men. So you can see here that chances of women developing depression are almost twice as high as compared to men. So now in the next couple of slides, we will be discussing um, that how depression occurs throughout the lifespan of uh, a woman, so to say. And we'll start with uh, childhood and early teenage years up until the menopause. So if you look at the slide, you will see that up until 11 years of age, there's really no difference in rates of depression between boys and girls. Uh, but as soon as the girls reach by the time the girls reach age 16, they are twice as likely than boys to have depression. Um, so right from there, the increased incidence uh, starts occurring for depression in women, uh, right from early teenage years. But next we go to the reproductive phase of a woman's life, what happens uh, then. And actually, um, reproductive lifespan of women consists of multiple phases. One of that is uh, a monthly cycle of menstruation. So if you notice in this slide, you will see that uh, uh, around menstruation, mood symptoms are very common. And the commonest uh, type of syndrome we see is mild premenstrual symptoms, which occurs in about three quarters of women. Uh, going through menstrual cycle, while much more severe uh, syndrome of uh, premenstrual syndrome, which is called PMS or premenstrual syndrome, occurs in about 20 to 40 percent of women. Now, these are uncomfortable symptoms, but not uh, a diagnosable clinical entity. About three to eight percent of women, though, go through what we call premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, which is a disabling condition um, and it requires treatment uh, by either the primary care physician or a psychiatrist. So as you can see that during the reproductive phase of their lives, women have multiple syndromes which they can have around their menstrual cycle. And Calmness one being premenstrual symptoms, mild in nature compared to a fully diagnosable syndrome of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now, another phase during reproductive life 
of a woman is pregnancy. So depression or mood disorder syndromes are very common around pregnancy. First of all, we'll discuss what is perinatal or peripartum period. So perinatal period is basically um, all from the start of pregnancy up until 28 days after the childbirth is the period which is called peripartum or perinatal. Um, so around perinatal time, depression can occur at various stages. So first thing is that depression can occur during pregnancy in, first, in, in the three trimester of pregnancy at any time. And about one in every seven to 10 women will have depression during pregnancy. Then the childbirth happens and about eight out of 10 women will suffer what we call postpartum blues after uh, giving birth to a child. The next syndrome which we encounter, a mood symptoms uh, syndrome, is postpartum depression, which occurs after the childbirth. Uh, and it happens in one in every five to eight childbirths. So if you see um, that overall perinatal depression, meaning depression developing during pregnancy as well as after the childbirth, the rate is about 11.5%. Uh, so it is pretty common. I just want to add one more thing um, that previously it was uh, considered as if pregnancy is a protective factor against depression, but that exactly is not the case actually. A woman is as likely, uh, almost as likely to develop depression during pregnancy um, or around pregnancy as compared to any other stages of uh, her life. So that leads us to the last syndrome which we encounter um, in the reproductive uh, age, uh, especially around pregnancy, is what we call postpartum psychosis, which develops in one in thousand childbirths. Now, it is fortunately uncommon condition, but it is extremely severe and dangerous, both for mother and baby. Um, it's treatable though, but it, it is a very serious condition which requires hospitalization. Then the last stage of uh, reproductive cycle is menopause and depression can also develop in what we call perimenopausal uh, duration or time. Um, why uh, women are more likely to develop depression during um, menopausal time, or perimenopausal again means uh, just before, during, and just after menopause. Uh, the risk is higher uh, for women who already have a uh, history of PMS or have uh, history of postpartum depression in previous pregnancies. So those are the women who are at more risk of developing uh, uh, this uh, perimenopausal depression. <clears throat> now, even if you have not had any episodes of depression, uh, your risk of developing new onset depression in perimenopausal period is high compared to other times. Now, why a woman may develop depression around this time. A, an intuitive thought which may come to your mind is definitely hormonal care. You know that uh, around menopause, the, the there is reduction in um, sex hormones, um, especially estrogen. So estro estrogen withdrawal may be the reason why women develop uh, uh, depression in perimenopausal period. But there's really no clear cut cause and effect relationship which we have found uh, between the levels, hormonal levels in the blood or the system and development of uh, depressive symptoms. So actually that can be definitely a cause uh, or, or risk factor for developing depression, but there are many other things which also influence um, um, depression development around menopause time. And what are other factors which may be contributing? One is those uncomfortable, um, unpleasant menopausal symptoms, such as sleep disturbance, heart flashes, sexual dysfunction, anxiety, can themselves lead to depressive symptoms uh, around this time. 
also this is the phase of life when social changes occur in in a woman's life for example this is the time when kids start leaving home or kids have left home um, leading to what we call you know empty nest syndrome and around the same time there are changes in your professional roles and social roles um, which can also lead to depression so in perimenopausal period hormonal changes social changes and um, facing men of uncom uncomfortable and unpleasant unpleasant menopausal symptoms all three can have um, contributory fact uh, all can be contributory factors for development depression in this uh, perimenopausal period this is again a slide it is just to emphasize which we have what we have already discussed you can see that women are always uh, throughout lifespan have increased rates of depression but there are some peaks also which you can see right here um, which we discussed like say in menopause depression is much higher in women uh, around that age compared to men So, so far we discussed that depression is common both in men and women. We discussed that depression uh, is especially common in women. We also uh, discussed that how depression presents itself across the lifespan um, of a uh, woman. But now we'll try to understand that uh, why women have higher rates of depression compared to men. Uh, so, we'll try to see what factors may be responsible for this increased um, expression of depression in women. The first thing is we all must know that mood disorders, including depression, are brain disorders. You know, these are not some imagined things which women imagine more than men. No, these are brain disorders with clear reasons uh, why somebody develops depression. So first, is that thing which we should understand. Second thing we should understand is that depression is not one, uh, not the result of one single cause, so to say. It is, uh, depression occurs because of environment and genes makeup, uh, the interaction of genetic makeup with the environment, and that results in depression. So as we noticed in the previous, in our previous slides, that <clears throat> depression is associated with the uh, ovarian hormone changes throughout the life cycle. Like it happens in early teenage years when a uh, girl must have just had the start of reproductive cycle. Then we see uh, depression with uh, menstrual cycle, pregnancy, and during menopausal time. So we know that Ovarian hormone fluctuations have something to do with depression, but as I said before, there's no direct relationship between hormonal levels and depressive symptoms, which we have established. One more thing I want to make clear that, of course, uh, depression occurs at higher frequency in women and occurs especially at the time of these hormonal transition. I just want to make sure that we all understand that majority of women will not experience depression or mood problems during reproductive transition. So it happens in a very sizable number of women, but majority of women would go through their uh, whole life cycle without developing depression. So I just want to um, put this point across. Now, so why some women develop depression in um, reproductive life compared to others? It probably is because of um, gene their genetic, some women's genetic makeup making them more uh, sensitive to fluctuations in hormone levels compared to others. So if a, a woman's uh, genetic makeup may be such that sensitivity to fluctuations in hormone uh, is higher compared to other women and therefore when these fluctuations happen, this woman develops a depression. Um, and again, it is not only hormone, but because it is gene and environment interaction, some other psychosocial factors uh, have to contribute also 
uh, for a woman to develop depression during these fluctuations. So biologically, you can say that the uh, depression is a brain disorder, which occurs because of gene and environment interaction. And some women are especially sensitive to fluctuations in their hormone levels. And therefore, these women develop um, depression around these transition phases, while most others just navigate through these changes without developing depression. Uh, these are all the times when the, the uh, hormones are fluctuating. So uh, we can assume that there is some relationship, but nobody has been able to establish direct relationship between um, hormone levels in the blood and depressive symptoms. But biologically, you can assume that changes or fluctuation in hormone levels are uh, one of the cause. For, um, for developing depression at higher rates. Then basically, uh, in general, we don't know exactly what causes depression and it is known uh, that it is not uh, totally genetic or totally environmental in origin, the depressive syndrome. It is the, the people develop depression because of uh, environmental interaction with their genetic makeup. So this is how we can assume that some women have heightened sensitivity to these fluctuation in hormone levels. So I want to make one point clear that majority of women go through these hormonal changes throughout their lifespan without developing depression. So most women do not experience depression uh, or mood problems during reproductive transitions as we discussed, but some do. So why these some women uh, do develop around those times is Probably the fact that because of their genetic makeup, they are they have heightened sensitivity to these fluctuations, and that's why they develop depressive symptoms compared to other women who go through these changes without any problems. So biologically, we can say that it is gene environmental interaction, and some people have increased sensitivity uh, to fluctuation in hormone levels, and those go on to develop depression at these various phases. But this is my opinion. I'm no authority on this subject, but this is my opinion. It is more important what happens in their social life, which is more uh, causative of depression in women. So this slide tells you that women not only experience more types of stressors, but they uh, face stressors during their lifespan at increased frequency as well. Just for an example, up to six to three, from six to 33% of women will suffer childhood sexual abuse. Now, about 15% of women will suffer adult sexual assault. And male partner violence is estimated between 15 to 71%. So women go through these stressors much more often uh, than, than men. So that trauma related to that uh, increases the vulnerability. On top of that, women in general are less than men, uh, which leads to chronic financial stress um, and poverty, increased poverty rates, and all associated problems which come with uh, people who are in financial stress uh, and live in poverty. On top of that, one more thing, uh, which is a um, well-known phenomena, is that women are more likely to react to stressor with depression compared to men. What I mean by that is that if a man and a woman both are exposed to similar level of stress or same type and intensity of stressor, it is more likely that women uh, will react by uh, getting depression compared to men. So as you can see that they have this vulnerability, they respond to stressor in uh, with depression more often, but on top of that, they also have increased exposure to various different types of, expo uh, uh, of traumatic events in their lives, which I believe is more the reason for increased rates of depression in women. So now we have tried to understand that uh, why depression is common, more common in women, and what may be the reason why they develop. Now let's see uh, how to identify <clears throat> that a person is suffering from depression. So these are, DSM is our diagnostic manual. 
which gives us uh, diagnostic criteria to diagnose psychiatric illnesses. And that says that depression in anybody, it is not related to only women, but uh, in any person, depression can be diagnosed if they show five or more of these symptoms in the same two weeks period of time. So, um, and one more uh, thing is there, uh, specification, that one of those symptoms has to be either depressed mood or diminished interest. So suppose a person comes to me and uh, has and report that he has been having, he or she has been having for two weeks, five of these symptoms, which are depressed mood, loss of pleasure, weight changes, uh, sleep changes, psychomotor agitation, fatigue, worklessness, difficulty concentrating, and thoughts of death or suicidalization. So if I find five of these symptoms, one of those uh, should be either depressed mood or loss of pleasure, and these symptoms are going on for two weeks, I would be thinking that patient has uh, um, major depression. But depression or any psychiatric disorder is diagnosed only when the symptoms result in um, significant distress or impairment in functioning. So I will have to cross that hurdle also before diagnosing depression that not only patient is showing sufficient symptoms for sufficient time, but also these symptoms are resulting in uh, psychosocial, psychosocial functional impairment. So just try to uh, make a mental picture. This is the picture of depression because more or less picture of depression remains the same in these syndromes with some additional um, symptoms uh, around the lifespan, reproductive lifespan. So these are symptoms of major depression. Now, we are going to discuss very briefly uh, specific syndrome, which we mentioned earlier, but we'll go in a little bit more detail that how depression presents in women across their lifespan. <clears throat> so as we discussed, that about 3 to 8% of women will have premenstrual dysphoric disorder uh, around their menstrual cycle. So <clears throat> what is that? Now, first of all, let's discuss who is more likely to develop uh, PMDD are people uh, or women who have either personal or family history of PMS, meaning premenstrual syndrome, PMDD, um, or depression in the family or themselves. So they are likely to develop PMDD. Also, lower educational level and smoking have been associated with development of uh, PMDD. <clears throat> Symptoms uh, of PMDD start about a week before menstruation and improve within a few days of start of the cycle. So this is the typical presentation of, uh, of PMDD. Symptoms last approximately 10 days, uh, 10, 12 days every month in the later half of the cycle. Now, what are the symptoms? Symptoms, again, as we discussed, depressed mood, loss of pleasure, sleep, appetite changes, concentration problems, and whatnot, as we discussed in previous slide. But they may also have breast tenderness, bloating, and headache along with this. Now, to be diagnosed, as we discussed before, these symptoms should be severe enough to affect their functioning. Unfortunate thing is that symptoms of PMDD uh, continue to increase throughout the reproductive cycle until menopause. And that's why it can become, for a woman, very troublesome to handle living in these, with these symptoms for 10, 12 days uh, every month. But, so that is unfortunate part that generally symptoms tend to increase uh, over the year until menopause, but good news is that very effective treatment is available. Uh, so one doesn't have to really suffer through these symptoms. So treatment of PMDD is basically changes in diet, regular things which uh, you would like to do, regular exercise, stress management, vitamin supplements, anti-inflammatory medications for uh, pain, et cetera, birth control pills. But in my area, antidepressants, especially what we call selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs are extremely effective. And this is very specific to PMDD that generally speaking, if you have seen a psychiatrist or psychiatric professional, everybody tells you that it will take up to four to six weeks before your symptoms improve. Uh, depression symptoms improve with SSRI or medication. But good thing in PMDD is that these medications are immediately effective. So uh, you 
meaning otherwise it would be counterintuitive to use these medication if it takes four to six weeks. But uh, in this condition, SSRIs start working almost immediately. Uh, various doctors prescribe these medications in various ways, um, uh, meaning some doctors would prefer to prescribe throughout the month, continuous prescription. Some doctors would suggest to prescribe only in the later half of the menstrual cycle. And some would even suggest that you start taking the medication on the day you start having symptoms and continue up until uh, the symptoms go away with onset of menstruation. So there is really no uh, benefit of taking it month long as far as the studies are concerned. And therefore, uh, later half, you know, a week, of the, meaning after 14th or 15th day of uh, menstrual cycle, uh, or symptom onset dosing is appropriate. So this is, we talk about uh, PMDD. Now, in next few slides, we will be talking about depression around pregnancy. So first, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the depression in pregnancy. Who gets depression in pregnancy? Again, risk factors are that if you have history of depression, you are more likely to develop depression during pregnancy. Same goes with if you have had postpartum depression or PMDD. Um, if you have relationship problems ongoing, you don't have social support, or if the pregnancy was unintended or unwanted, or if you had a miscarriage, these are some risk factors uh, with, do, uh, because of which you, may, uh, you are more likely to develop depression. Same goes for infertility treatments are associated with depression. Then it goes without saying that if you were being treated with antidepressant, and it was effective and you discontinued it, then it is likely that you will develop depression in pregnancy. Now, sometimes you, apart from pregnancy, you may be going through many other stressors uh, in your life. If that is the case, that is also a risk factor. So these are the risk factors who develops depression in pregnancy. And signs and symptoms in, of depression in pregnancy are similar to as we discussed for major depressive episodes like depressed mood, appetite, sleep changes, concentration, suicidal ideation, everything, all gamut can occur. So these are the risk factors and symptoms. Now let's see <clears throat> what does depression do to pregnancy? This is very important to understand because uh, depression during pregnancy has its consequences. And that is why it is so important that we treat depression. So. What happens if you had depression during pregnancy? That symptoms themselves, like poor appetite, can result in nutritional problems for you and the baby. So uh, that is one you know, very self-evident thing. Same thing is that there is a symptom of depression that you lose interest in doing things or motivation goes. That can result in poor self-care or uh, poor follow-up with prenatal care. Again, a harmful thing for the uh, baby and yourself. Now, depression is also associated with harmful substance use, uh, such as smoking, drinking. So uh, that obviously has not only harmful effect on you, but also on the baby. So that can be a consequence of depre untreated depression. Now, when you are not interacting with other people in your life because of depression, you may lose support from friends and family and this may complicate uh, pregnancy. Then one effect of depression is well established uh, that people um, who have depression during pregnancy tend to have preterm labor and birth and their babies are low birth weight, birth weight babies. So these are some of the effects of uh, depression. So you can see that Depression can affect pregnancy in multiple ways, and all of those are harmful to you as well as the baby. And therefore, depression needs to be treated uh, aggressively. Then the second syndrome, as we discussed earlier on, that uh, that develops around pregnancy is baby blues. Uh, baby blues is uh, basically a temporary condition which occurs, as we discussed, in up to 80% of the childbirths. It occurs around 
two to three days after the delivery of the baby and resolves within 10 days. Generally speaking, without much consequences in most people. But it is not as uh, you know benign a condition as we initially thought because people who have history of baby blues, this can be a risk factor for developing postpartum depression in subsequent pregnancies. Um, what are the symptoms of baby blues? Again, lasts only for about a week or so, developing two to three days after the delivery, uh, over by 10 days after delivery. But during those six, seven days, uh, the person may have crying spells, irritability, poor sleep, emotional reactivity. These are the symptoms of baby blues. Um, now, there's really no specific treatment required, except that uh, the mother should be assured rest and sleep, uh, mother should continue to keep her interest in activity levels, should not hesitate to ask uh, for help from others. And all these symptoms, uh, all these interventions will lead to improvement in symptoms. And majority of people will recover from these blues without any adverse outcome. But then, if you remember, we had discussed that second postpartum condition was postpartum depression. Uh, which is not baby blues. It's not going to go away in seven to 10 days time. It is a condition which will cause significant impairment in function and will require treatment. So that is the second condition which we call, um, which again comes under the umbrella term of perinatal or peripartum depression, but generally people know by the term postpartum depression. So again, who are the people who are likely to develop uh, postpartum depression. Um, and again, as we discussed early on, if you remember, one in every five to eight women uh, will have uh, postpartum de depression. So it is a fairly common condition and should not be confused with uh, baby blues, uh, which is self-limiting um, syndrome, so to say. So again, uh, women who have history of uh, depression during pregnancy or prior to becoming pregnant. So if you have a steer depression before or during pregnancy, you're likely to develop uh, postpartum depression. Same goes for PMDD. If there's a family history of mood disorder, that increases your risk of developing um, you know, postpartum depression. <clears throat> some other uh, risk factors are that if there was some ambivalence, meaning uh, you were not sure whether you should become pregnant or not, um, but you did, that can be a risk factor. And so is if you carry multiple pregnancies, such as having twins or triplets. Young mothers who are living alone and have a number of children, uh, more than one child, those are other risk factors to develop postpartum depression. And so is also true if you have a child who has significant health problems or uh, a child with special needs you're likely to have uh, depression in postpartum period. Limited social support, marital conflict, and uh, if you have stress, some other type of stress in your life. So all these are the risk factors for postpartum depression. Um, so one should be aware that if somebody has history of depression in the past or developed depression during pregnancy, one should be a lookout uh, in postpartum period you know, because uh, it may occur and you may need to be treated. So what are the symptoms of postpartum depression? Um, basically symptoms are same as the major depressive episode we discussed, but there may be some other symptoms like a uh, person may be crying, having feelings of anger, the person may withdraw from loved ones, feeling disconnected from the baby. Um, this is one very specific thing and occurs commonly that they worry that you might hurt uh, your baby in some ways and feeling guilty as if you are not a good mom or you will be able to, to care for your baby. So these are some additional symptoms of depression in postpartum period, along with uh, depressive symptoms we discussed before. <clears throat> so now let's discuss how do we treat depression in the perinatal or peripartum period, meaning all three trimesters of pregnancy and after the pregnancy, uh, after the childbirth. 
Now, again, we are not going to go into every single medication use and pros and cons of that, but we'll just discuss some general principle of treatment of depression during pregnancy. So first and foremost, everybody should know that uh, untreated depression uh, has adverse consequences for mother and baby, as we just discussed, right? Uh, and there is sufficient support in literature uh, which supports treatment of depression uh, adequately during pregnancy rather than leaving it untreated. Um, risk of treatment uh, always should be weighed against leaving depression untreated uh, before embarking on treatment. So before you start treatment, definitely you should uh, uh, weigh the risk, uh, pros and cons of treatment versus not treating. But evidence is heavily in favor of treating uh, depression. Now, uh, when you are discussing with your doctor, you should discuss not all available treatment option, but also option of no treatment should be discussed. Now, one thing which I cannot emphasize enough is that if you are already on treatment, you should not automatically discuss, discontinue the treatment without discussing with your doctor, uh, because risk of relapse is very high in uh, perinatal period. So that definitely goes without saying. Now, what uh, other principles we should follow during pregnancy and postpartum period. This is one which uh, I generally recommend that if psychotherapy or talk therapy is a viable option, we should consider it. There is <clears throat> really no better option if it is a viable option though. And we should avoid medications in general. Uh, you might have heard this thing in first trimester of pregnancy, all external substances should be avoided, you know, if possible. And that goes for antidepressant as well. But it doesn't mean that you cannot treat depression with antidepressant even in first trimester. Now, if medication is the treatment of choice, it is generally recommended that you treat per, uh, a patient in uh, pregnancy with one single medication rather than exposing the patient and the child with multiple medication. But again, that should not leave depression under treated. So if needed in a particular case, more than one medication, yes, we should go there. But generally speaking, if you can avoid it, better it is. Now, during the later half of pregnancy or third trimester of pregnancy, you may have to increase the dose of antidepressant. The reason being that the volume of distribution of the medication becomes very high and the medication gets diluted because of the increased volume and therefore those may need to be increased. So that is another principle we follow. And you should always continue to dose, uh, meaning antidepressant should be continued throughout um, delivery as well as beyond. Last thing I will say about antidepressant treatment, antidepressants are equally effective. You know, no one is better in pregnancy as well as uh, outside pregnancy. All antidepressants are equally effective. It's just simply a matter of finding the right medication for a person. Now, why we are so worried about treatment of depression during <clears throat> pregnancy and postpartum period? So basically the concerns are, what, are, what may be the concern a person or a doctor may have? That can these medication result in birth defect? Can these medication result in uh, effect on baby, meaning on baby's growth? Can these medication cause, medications cause behavioral problems in the baby? Or can these medications result in withdrawal symptoms when the baby is out of mother's womb? Uh, because till now, the baby was getting this medication, now he's out of circulation, so whether it will cause withdrawal symptoms. So let's discuss one by one very quickly. Number one, uh, the first line antidepressant medications, SSRI, SNRI, now we have sufficient data to suggest that there's really no increased risk of birth defects with uh, first-line antidepressant medication. So we can rest on this, uh, uh, meaning on this issue that antidepressant use will result in increased risk of uh, depression, no, increased risk of birth defects. But again, the first principle we had to follow that if we can avoid a medication during first trimester, we should do it. But if we had to treat, then there's really no uh, evidence suggesting a clear risk of birth defects with, uh, uh, with antidepressant use. Second question is whether 
the medic antidepressant medication result in some growth issues or preterm birth. Yes, there is some evidence for that, that uh, kids born while being exposed to antidepressant have lower birth weight and preterm birth. But if you remember earlier on, untreated depression has the same effect as well. So we cannot really tease out whether leaving depression will be better choice or treating it. So I think it, here we are equal on the same uh, level, treating or untreating. So I would go in favor of treating depression. Now, whether antidepressant result in longer lasting behavioral problems in the kids who were exposed in uterus, actually there's no real evidence that behavioral disturbance or cognitive problems are more common in babies uh, who were exposed. So again, I would not have that concern weighing on my mind very heavily. <clears throat> Last thing is withdrawal symptoms. Yes, those can happen in the neonate, uh, those who were exposed to the um, antidepressant. But again, these are self-limiting mild symptoms uh, which a neonate can tolerate very well. And this should not, this alone should not be the reason not to offer treatment. So these are the four concerns which anybody would have when deciding whether to treat or not. And in general, treatment is considered safer. Same goes for breastfeeding. Actually, again, we would like to avoid any exposure uh, to the breastfeeding uh, uh, neonate or infant. But uh, not breastfeeding has even more risk uh, than antidepressant exposure to the infant. So in general, with current uh, first-line medications, breastfeeding can be done without much risk, but again, it should be discussed um, with your provider. One last thing I will add, in postpartum depression, uh, that autoimmune thyroiditis is very common in postpartum period. So if somebody develops postpartum depression, uh, they should be checked for their thyroid function. Then around pregnancy, this is the last syndrome, which is postpartum psychosis. If you remember, it happens in one in 1,000, but it is really a very serious and dangerous condition in which the person uh, develops symptoms of psychosis and mania, so to say. And who is at risk of developing those? The people who have history of bipolar disorder, who have had postpartum psychosis in previous pregnancy, they are at increased risk. Those women who have family history of psychosis or bipolar disorder, those can develop. People have history of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. And lastly, if somebody who was on medication, psychiatric medication and discontinued during pregnancy can have postpartum psychosis. One thing I want to say about postpartum psychosis, generally people or women who develop a postpartum psychosis in the end turn out to have bipolar disorder majority of times. So it is basically undiagnosed bipolar disorder declaring itself in postpartum period. That is what the clinical picture is. Now symptoms, there are multiple symptoms, but I just, uh, because we are about, yeah, running out of time, so I'll just go through. Basically, a uh, person presents with severe uh, manic symptoms, so to say, and also psychotic symptoms such as delusions or hallucinations. Delusions are the beliefs or the uh, thoughts or beliefs such as that you may suddenly start believing in postpartum period that you have won the lottery. You may think that your baby is possessed by devil or becoming paranoid that people are out to get you. These are some delusions which you can develop and hallucinations like you can you will may see or hear things which are not there so uh, and same way manic symptoms are that you feel very high on top of the world all the time you have rapid changes in mood feel restless and agitated and you be, you behave out of character so these are some symptoms of uh, postpartum psychosis again very very dangerous situation um, and how do we treat it Basically, patient really, uh, these patients need hospitalization. They cannot be treated under any circumstance uh, as an outpatient. Now, generally, we know that baby and mother should not be separated. It is not ideal, but in this condition, it is needed. So you have to. Um, <clears throat> I also, mother should not be left alone with the baby and unless uh, you have treated postpartum psychosis adequately and you want to treat psychosis, agitation, insomnia early on uh, to prevent worsening of these symptoms. 
and the medications. So I just put some names there, but these are not the only medications, but you use antipsychotic medications to treat uh, psychotic symptoms, sedative medications to prevent agitation and improve sleep, and mood stabilizers you use to treat, um, you know, basically manic symptoms of mood instability. Now, generally, you can uh, breastfeed your child uh, in these uh, with these medications on board, but it is important that this discussion should happen, and if uh, your provider says, no, we should not be exposing, then we can do without breastfeeding also. And the last condition in a woman's life, which uh, is perimenopausal depression, as we discussed earlier on, again, symptoms are similar to major depression. Uh, again, perimenopausal women are more at risk of developing depression, as we discussed. Symptoms are similar to uh, major depression, but then there can be some additional symptoms such as heart flashes, which are the hallmark of uh, menopause anyway. Treatment is also the same uh, with medications and psychotherapy. There's really no FDA approved hormone replacement therapy for perimenopausal depression, although multiple hormonal treatments have been tried. But if you ask me uh, that how would you treat a perimenopausal woman who comes with depression, I would still be treating with uh, regular antidepressant as any other episode of depression. So in summary, this is, I believe, the last slide. Uh, depression is common, especially in women. But most women, this I want all of us to understand this thing, that depression may be more common in women, but most women do not become depressed at various stages of reproductive cycle. And they go through this whole hormonal cycle throughout their lifespan without becoming depressed. But uh, compared to men, they have more likelihood. Uh, this is another fact which we need to pay attention to that majority of people, men and women alike, do not seek treatment for depression. And treatment of depression is effective treatment. So I mean, there should be more awareness. And probably while we talk about uh, treatment of depression, like in these forums, it will increase awareness and probably see more people will seek treatment. Now, as we discussed, untreated depression can have very serious consequences for you as well as the baby. Uh, and therefore, uh, treatment should be sought. As we discussed uh, and talked about, depression is very treatable across lifespan in men and women, and even during various stages of uh, hormonal life of a woman. So um, at least uh, get this from this talk that depression in pregnancy, around pregnancy, and other stages of reproductive life is very treatable. And generally, these treatment are, treatments are very safe for mother and baby. And scientific evidence actually tells you that it is better to treat depression across women's lifespan rather than leaving it untreated.